Okay, well, hello everybody. I'm Terry Farrell. And uh, today I'm gonna to be talking to you about my research on uh, reptiles and amphibians in Florida with a focus on a introduced species of parasite. And so I'm gonna actually, you can see the screen share. I'm gonna put it in presentation mode and uh, we'll get into this. I've shown you a pygmy rattlesnake, which is a species I've worked on for decades. Um, which will figure into this talk. Um, and it's really what got me interested in this topic to begin with. Um, but what we're dealing with in terms of my research, um, and for example, in some research Dr. Gibbs talked about a couple of weeks ago, is part of a much larger issue. And that's the issue of globalization. And so a uh, simple definition of that is where you have much more interaction and integration among peoples, uh, governments, industries worldwide. And it involves not just humans, but because we influence so many other species, it involves them. And so, for example, I've shown you a slide of a giant uh, container ship entering Tampa and the port of Tampa now receives much more traffic. This ship is coming in from Southeast Asia than it ever did. And that traffic sometimes has inadvertent stowaways in the form of uh, small reptiles, amphibians, insects, and so on, but it's also part of a massive wildlife trade. And this wildlife trade has huge implications. Um, and it's, uh, you know, to be quite honest, that what we see in many cases is when we bring in species of wildlife, like these Asian tree pythons for the pet market or whatever, we uh, bring with them parasites and pathogens. And this is exactly what started the coronavirus epidemic we're currently suffering through among humans. But the same thing has happened repeatedly with wildlife. And so if you look at the Southeastern United States, we've been invaded by species from all over the globe. And for example, on Stetson's campus, the two most abundant species are probably brown anoles and Cuban tree frogs, neither of which are native to Florida. Everyone knows about Burmese pythons um, that have invaded South Florida. And basically what I'm gonna talk about is how these characters and a bunch of others are having huge impacts on native wildlife. Um, and so the phenomenon I'm talking about is an indirect one where the Burmese python may eat animals and have a direct impact on them, but by bringing a parasite to Florida, it has now indirect influences on our species. And so the Burmese python apparently brought with it from Asia a lung parasite that hangs out in other species of snakes. And it has successfully spread from Burmese pythons to things like this black racer. And you can see the head of the snake and a bunch of the parasites that have been removed from its lung. And we know a lot about this due to Christina Miller, who did her PhD thesis on this at Auburn. She spent a lot of time in Florida and she found we've got this Asian parasite, which is Raleatella orientalis, um, I'll call it RO. Um, and so it came into Florida, presumably with Burmese python. And then we had what we call parasite spillover, where it moved into the environment and now infects many species of native snakes. And when Miller was studying it in the teens, you know, 2014, 2015, 2016, and as she wrote up her thesis, it was thought that the geographic range of the parasite was restricted to Southern Florida, where we have these established Burmese python populations. <clears throat> and I became interested in this when we suddenly saw this, that. Craig Lind, a collaborator of mine and I, were working on other projects involving pygmy rattlesnakes. And one of our snakes died and out of its mouth came crawling a host of parasites, these ugly white worms, which are pentastomes. And they are the pentastome that Miller identified as invading Florida from Southeast Asia. And so this actually is some disgusting video. I won't dwell on it. Um, but in it, you can see 
these parasites are in a dissected snake. Um, and so this is the ribs of the snake, the body wall. And then all these wiggly guys look a little like spaghetti are the parasites. These are the penistomes, which will suck blood. The snake has a huge thin lung and they're all in that lung cavity, liver, gut. Here's the other body wall. Um, and so basically what's going on here is we have parasites ending up in snakes. We thought that they were just in South Florida, the area where Miller found them is shaded in red. The yellow sites are places we found them more than 180 kilometers north of that. And now we know just recently they've shown up right by Gainesville. Um, and so it appears that we have really rapid spread of this parasite northward along the Florida Peninsula. Um, and that makes it a real conservation concern. And so quick general background, pentastomes are a really odd group of parasites. They're crustaceans um, and fish parasites are most closely related to them. They tend to reside as sexually reproducing adults. That's when we call them uh, in the definitive host in the lungs of reptiles. Um, often snakes or alligators, crocodiles, or turtles. The eggs get passed from the reptiles in feces, and then it gets tricky. There's probably a complex life cycle where you have one or more intermediate hosts, one who basically eats soil or fecal material and gets infected and then passes it on to another species and ultimately the definitive host, in this case, the snakes get infected by eating these other species that have consumed eggs at some point in their life or encountered larvae in some points of their life. And I'll talk more about that. And so this particular species, as I said, is native to Asia. It's already invaded Australia and uh, Crystal Keller here has done a nice job of documenting that. But what we don't know anywhere in the world, including where it's from, is what the intermediate hosts are. So we know almost nothing about the life history of this parasite. And its impacts on snake health are really poorly understood. That's true not just of this species, but no one has ever done a study to look at the impact of penistone parasites on snake health. Um, it's a, a real lack of knowledge on this. Here's a close-up of a penistome. They're called penistomes, which means like five mouths. This is the actual mouth, but they've got four short appendages with some nasty fang-like hooks. And early people thought, oh, it looks like it's got five mouths and hence the name pentastome. And so I'm gonna talk about a bunch of different study questions, which species serve as definitive hosts, um, are they prevalent? Do we see lots of snakes infected or only a few? Um, we'll talk about some impacts on snake health and snake populations. Um, we'll talk about who some of these intermediate hosts might be and what impacts the parasite has on those intermediate hosts. And we also wanna know why this parasite is spreading so rapidly. It's kind of a stunning pace of geographic range expansion. And so I collaborate with this on a bunch of people that all the work we're doing is really being done at Stetson in the surrounding area. But I've got two veterinarians, uh, PhDs in veterinary medicine who are faculty members at UF in the College of Veterinary Medicine who are working with me. Um, I've got Craig Lind, he's actually a former um, Brown scholar. So the Brown Center is doing all kinds of things with this research to support it. Um, and one of them was allowing us to bring Craig Lind in as a postdoc, and he's continued to collaborate with us on various aspects of this research. Um, we've got other researchers who specialize in metabolic rates, in DNA analysis, in hormone analysis, so that we create samples and send them to them, and they can tell us all kinds of interesting things about our snakes and parasites. We've got the PhD collaborators but we've also got a load of Stetson student collaborators. I tend to do a lot of this research in the summer. And so it's really important that I uh, have Stetson student collaborators. And so for example, um, 
some of the summer research is done under sure grant funding. And so Jenna Pomisano uh, worked on that. And I typically, when I work with students, talk with them, we find something they're excited about, and then they take over certain aspects. So Jenna took over lizard and frog infection studies. Carson did toad infection studies. Maria did mouse infection studies. Um, a series of students have worked on roach infection studies. So we're basically introducing parasite eggs and larvae into lots of different potential species to figure out life cycles. Um, right now, Amber and Catherine are looking at snake infection studies. I've got other students looking at what's going on in the wild. And so basically it's been a great thing for about a dozen students who conducted their senior research on the Penistone project and work with me plus the collaborators that I showed you on the last slide. So we work together in a variety of ways. Here's Maddie Wheeler and Jenna Palmasano helping me get a cloacal, cloacal wash, basically a fecal sample uh, from a mud snake. And so they can help with sampling. Um, Jenna is hugely helpful. Um, she just actually, I talked to her last week, she just got a job in Arizona. She's interested in doing conservation work for a living and she's got a job working with a really good research group at Arizona State University on their Gila monster and tiger rattlesnake projects. Uh, they also do work in Southeast Asia on king cobras that she's uh, excited to hopefully get to go over there as well. There's Maddie dissecting a snake and she did a lot of dissections and so have several other students. They learn a lot about snakes this way but they can count the parasites inside the snakes. Um, and we also determine if snakes are, are infected through non-destructive methods. We usually use road kills for snake dissection. We don't like to kill snakes. Um, and live snakes, we get fecal samples from, and these fecal samples have eggs. Um, and so you can see on this, one of these eggs, it's a little hard to see the uh, actual uh, hooks on that spherical object, but that's a baby penistome hanging out in an egg. Um, and snake fecal samples will have loads of these eggs if you have pentastomes in the lung of the snake. And so we can figure these things out. We identify them to species ultimately by having these things, uh, the DNA sequenced um, through our collaborators at UF. Uh, there's a couple different penistome species and we wanna make sure we've got the right one. And so if you start thinking about the kinds of things we've discovered is one is lots more species of snakes have penistome parasites than we thought. Um, so Miller in her PhD found oh, about 14 species of snakes with penistomes. We found pygmy rattlesnakes had them. Now we found scarlet king snakes have them. And you can see this scar scarlet king snake that's been dissected with the penistomes removed from its lung. Um, here you can see whoop, um, a novel host, a coral snake with penistomes. Uh, Right now, my uh, chat function isn't up. It didn't pop out properly. So just unmute yourself if you want to ask a question. I'd rather you just ask questions verbally and feel free to do that at any time. Um, but this coral snake has little penistomes. And here's a video we made of one. You can see those little hooked appendages moving. Um, and this coral, this is kind of interesting because it's a pentastome which has uh, just recently um, infected the snake. It's about the size that we see them in intermediate hosts. Here's a ribbon snake, another new uh, species for penistome hosts. And you can see this guy hanging out down here in the lung of the snake. Um, and so we're finding lots of new hosts. Um, Here's a big list of hosts and you can see ones we've found plus the ones Miller originally found. Um, I've got some color coding in there. Basically different families of snakes are in different colors like pit vipers are in red. And basically what this is telling you when you see pit vipers, colubrid snakes in black 
any lapid snakes, like the coral snake in blue, is that this parasite is impacting all kinds of snakes. It's really troublesome what an extreme generalist this species is. So our prevalence data, if we look at that, well, basically shows that prevalence is simply the number of individuals that we sample who are positive, that in central Florida right now, even though this parasite only showed up a couple of years ago, a quarter of our snakes are infected. A third of black racers are infected. I've got some higher numbers associated with low sample sizes, but basically we've got lots of infected snakes in local snake populations, which is also worrisome. Um, and so basically we worry about not just are they infected, but how many parasites are they carrying? We call that infection intensity. And so the students have dissected snakes and sometimes, for example, in this pygmy rattlesnake, you open up the lung, you can actually see the heart, trachea coming down, elongate liver. Um, you've got only a single penistome. It's pretty big, but it's only a single penistome. In this snake over here, you can see there's a bunch of them. Um, and so sometimes the infection rates are really quite high, the infection intensity. Um, this is the champion, the Presser Hall black racer that was incredibly sick and near death. It died a day after we captured it. And it had over a hundred penistomes in its lung. And there's a bunch of these penistomes that were removed from the snake. And so it's really, troubling just how many snakes are infected, and in some cases, how intense they are. And these pentastome parasites are all pumping out huge numbers of eggs. Um, our data shows basically that pygmy rattlesnakes and black racers not only have more pentastomes than Burmese pythons in South Florida, but they have bigger pentastomes. And so, each penistome on average is longer in a pygmy rattlesnake or a black racer. That's probably, you know, just a couple feet long compared to an eight or 10 foot long mass of Burmese python in South Florida. And it may be the fact that our snakes don't have any evolutionary history with this parasite. And so the parasite is just kind of running rampant in them. Whereas the Burmese pythons have existed for quite likely millions of years with these penistomes and have evolved some level of resistance. Um, I'm not gonna to talk too much about the health impacts. Our veterinarian collaborators have done a lot of careful works on specimens we've sent them. Um, but just to give you an idea of what's going on is one thing is, is you can have suffocation if a pentastome blocks the trachea. And this shows a snake we found dead. Um, it's hard to know why it died, um, but the penistome in its lung is just as thick as the trachea. And so there's the air passage blocking is one potential issue. Um, another potential issue is the penistome seem to weaken snakes and they often show significant, uh, what we call comorbidity, other nasty conditions. So sometimes it's snake fungal disease. In this case, we've got little parasites like this guy right here, hopefully you can see my cursor, this one down here. These are a parasitic flatworm. Uh, so a separate species, a native species of parasite often seems to infect snakes in concert with the big nasty penistomes. And we suspect it's because the penistomes are damaging the snake's immune systems by just weakening them so much that they become open to all other kinds of infections. Here's the local area. You can see the land um, right in the middle. Um, and those red pentagons indicate where we're finding snakes that are penistome positive. I haven't shown you where we found penistome negative snakes. Um, they're sprinkled throughout this area, but basically we're finding snakes that are penistome positive that are infected by these penistomes all over the place. In some cases, urban areas, in some cases, natural areas that are protected like Tiger Bay State Forest, Seminole State Forest, Lake Woodruff National Wildlife Refuge. This parasite is not only affecting lots of different species of snakes,
but we find it in lots of different habitat types. And so the parasite RO is found in pine flatwoods and freshwater marsh and hardwood hammocks, scrub habitat, and college campuses that we've got them on Stetson's campus. Uh, so this thing is all over the place, uh, both in terms of the species of snakes it's inhabiting and the habitats it's in. So one of the things we really want to figure out, since no one knows this and it's important if we're going to ever control this parasite, is to figure out its life cycle. And so some penistomes have fairly simple life cycles. For example, rodents will, in their feeding, consume penistome eggs in soil, get infected, and then that infects the snake. Um, that doesn't seem to be the case with RO, the species we're studying. We suspect that it involves insects and lizards and frogs and snakes. And so we may actually have two intermediate hosts. And then snakes are what we call the definitive host where the parasite hangs out in the lungs and sexually reproduces. The parasite stays really small in these intermediate hosts in most penistome species um, and doesn't seem to cause a lot of damage. And so, if you look at the species that have lots of penistomes, things like black racers and pygmy rattlesnakes, they're extreme generalists. They eat all kinds of stuff, rodents, lizards, frogs, other snakes. And so they could be picking up the parasite from a lot of different prey. And so we started looking at different prey types and doing infection studies to see which of these things could actually host, successfully host a parasite. And so, I got a couple of picture here of uh, Sam McPherson and uh, Jenna Palmasano infecting lizards with penistomes. And the way we do this is we capture brown anoles, we get them used to captive conditions in the reptile ecology lab in Sage Hall. We feed half the anoles food contaminated with penistome eggs that we get from snakes that are infected with penistomes. We can microscopically see that there's penistome eggs there. And we basically, in this case, take fat bodies out of crickets. These lizards love to eat crickets. And we dust the fat bodies in uh, snake feces filled with penistome eggs. You pick up a lizard, it gapes at you. And then Jenna very deftly deposits the fat globule in the lizard's mouth and it swallows them. And after that, we have to maintain the lizards for months, regularly weighing them, looking at survival. And at certain intervals, we'll euthanize a pair of lizards, a control lizard and an experimental lizard, and see if they contain penistome larvae. And so we can see if we can infect these guys. Are they actually potential intermediate hosts if they're exposed to penistomes? And they are. If you look at Anola segrii from this experiment, you look in their body cavity, each of these little, uh, we call them ghosts at this stage. They kind of look like a cartoon ghost. And these are in the membrane that surrounds the body cavity. Um, and in this is kind of, they're, oh, about a millimeter long. And we believe this is the infectious stage. Earlier, they're smaller, hard to find, and kind of embedded in tissue. And it seems that when they get to the infectious stage, they migrate to the outer part of the body cavity and they're often really abundant and conspicuous um, on that membrane surrounding the body wall. And you can see this particular lizard is just packed with them. Um, we can figure out lots of things from these kinds of experiments. For example, here we look at days post exposure when we dissected the lizard and whether we could detect penistomes in it. And all of these are exposed lizards. And if you're out there about 40 days after the lizard has consumed penistome eggs, we can't find the little parasites. But they're presumably there because once you get to about 76 days, you find them densely in those membranes in the body wall, and they're easy to find and abundant. And you can see that after 75 days, basically, everybody is infected. And so we collect data like this to get an idea of how rapidly this life cycle is progressing. And it seems to take about two, two and a half months from ingesting eggs to becoming infected for 
lizards to get these large penistome larvae. That's a larvae, a penistome larvae in a ribbon snake lung, and it's about the same size as what we're seeing in our lizards after a couple months. And we've done loads of studies in the last really year and a half. Um, and when we feed them eggs, these are all penistome egg studies. When we just feed them eggs, we find that brown anoles get infected, discoid roaches get infected, but frogs didn't get infected. We were very surprised at that. Um, and also we did an experiment with house mice um, and Marie found the house mice didn't become infected. And so only some things are prone to becoming infected if they eat eggs. Um, but you have to wonder, is that really how infection occurs? I mean, discoid roaches and roaches in general are known to be coprophagous, which means they eat crap. Um, and basically, um, it seems likely that roaches would actually get infected this way. But lizards don't consume a lot of dirt. They don't eat snake feces. They avoid anything that smells like snakes. And so it may not be that infection typically takes place through consuming eggs. It's probably more likely infection takes place for both things like frogs and lizards and mice by eating infected insects like roaches. And so we did a series of studies where we looked at frogs, these are leopard frogs, southern leopard frogs, and we fed them infected roaches. And we did this once, and you're actually looking at the moment a frog gets infected. Here comes another roach. Boom, and you can hear my voice every once in a while here. Um, it's also, I like this for the students because they're working with a bunch of animals here, and that one's a brown uh, southern leopard frog. Some aren't that color. They have different personalities. They learn about feeding. They basically get some deep insight. When you spend two months taking care of these animals and feeding them several times a week and so on, they're learning a huge amount about these animals, not just learning about penistomes. But how much fun is it to basically do a research project where you get to play with frogs and feed them? And so when we did the roach study where we fed roaches to mice, frogs, and lizards, we found that the leopard frogs and the lizards got infected. And it's interesting, all the studies where we do infection stuff, when we look at survival and impact on growth, when you compare infected animals to control animals, the penistomes are having no impact that we can detect on host health. Um, and that's very different than what happens in snakes, where they appear to cause extremely deleterious impacts. Um, the mice were ambiguous here. And at first we thought, oh, we infected the mice because when we dissected mice, we'd see things like this. This is basically, you can look at that, the blood vessels in the uh, body wall. You can see there's some fur there. And you see these white objects on the digestive tract and other organs. When you open them up though, they're, they're very small. They're heavily calcified. And so you actually have to smash them to get into them. And vertebrates, particularly mammals, often heavily calcify um, nasty things that get lodged in their body. And the immune system appears to kill these things. So the penistomes that were inside these insisted white structures were always dead. It was just remnants of their exoskeleton and no live larvae in them. And so we don't think that uh, mice are actually good intermediate hosts. So kind of leading you along, we want to get back to snakes that, you know, in this particular case, we've got a bunch of roaches we infected. We waited months to see what happened there. Then we took the roaches and fed them to frogs and lizards. We waited months to see what's going on there. And now we're finally at the stage where we can take our lab generated infected frogs and lizards and feed them to snakes to see if we can generate infections there and really study the impacts of infection experimentally where we have control snakes that are fed 
lizards and frogs that are not contaminated with penistomes and infected snakes who get a prey item that has penistome larvae in it. And so this is uh, Catherine Moran holding up one of our 38 or so banded water snakes. Um, Catherine has been a huge help with this project. She started last summer as a shore grant student. She's continued to work to this day on the snakes. And for her, it's been a really perfect senior research project, summer grant project, because she's interested in veterinary medicine. She'd like to actually work not on companion animals, but um, things like zoo animals and more uh, exotic forms of wildlife. And uh, she, uh, two days ago, just found out she's been accepted to Tufts uh, Med School. That's the second med school she's been accepted, but she's super excited about getting into Tufts because they have one of the preeminent zoo med, uh, vet med programs in the country. And so she's done a great job on this research. And I think it's also helped her because she's able to talk to professionals about some really cool things she's doing with these parasites. And so I'm not gonna give you any results from the snake study. It's too early to know what's going on there, but let's take it out of the lab and think about what's going on in the real world. And I study these things both at places like Lake Woodruff National Wildlife Refuge, where we've got all this long-term data. We've got 30 years worth of data from that study site in terms of reptiles and amphibians. And then I also lived for a long time in Brandywine, a neighborhood north of town, right, up by Trails West in the Brandywine Shopping Center. Um, this is basically Chris Griffin's backyard, I mean, literally. Um, that there's a retention ditch back there with a femoral pond that lots of toads and Cuban tree frogs like to breed in. Um, and if you look at uh, this area, you end up finding that you've got a lot of penistomes there. And so we're studying basically intermediate hosts, things like lizards and frogs, both in really natural environments and also highly urbanized environments. Um, and we're getting an idea of what goes on there by collecting lots of things, dissecting them, and seeing where the parasites are. And so there's a lot going on on this slide. Let's first of all, just focus on who we're dealing with. We've got a couple species of toads, southern toads, spadefoot toads, uh, kind of those conventional leopard frogs that I showed you the video of, some tree frogs, both native tree frogs like the green tree frog and introduced tree frogs like the Cuban tree frogs. We've got native lizards like the green anole and we've got invasive lizards like the Cuban anole um, and so on. And so if we collect these animals and we've collected a bunch of them and dissected them, one of the things we find is that regardless of the study site, the natural area or the more urbanized site, lots of individuals are carrying the parasite. And so presumably if they're eaten by a snake, the snakes will become infected. We think southern toads are a really important carrier. Um, we've looked at actually, the, I've got some more recent data, uh, spadefoot toads often also carry it. Um, interestingly, out in the field, southern leopard fogs don't seem to be carrying a lot of this. Um, they get it easily when we feed them infected roaches in the lab, but this may be the kind of thing where in natural environments, they're not eating the right insects to uh, generate infection. Uh, tree frogs also, uh, green tree frogs to be specific in the natural site, only rarely carried the penistome, but Cuban tree frogs, which are only found in brandywine, um, they're typical of more urbanized sites in Florida, are highly infected and often carry lots of parasites within them. Um, also, interestingly, brown anoles are often infected. And so we're getting an idea, first of all, for the first time, these are really the first data anyone has ever found this parasite in its intermediate host. And so we're getting a really good idea that certain species of frogs and certain species of lizards are apparently really important in terms of spreading the parasite. Um, and what I think is really worrisome here is that some of these things, that if you think about roaches, Cuban tree frogs, and these Cuban brown anoles, 
they are human associates. They like hanging around humans. You've got human tree frogs quite likely in outdoor potted plants in your yard. You've got brown anoles hanging out in the tubes of your yard furniture and you know in your potted plants. Uh, anytime a nursery in Florida ships out plants, they typically have both human tree frogs and brown anoles in them. Um, they may also have roaches in them. And so right now, humans are undoubtedly spreading this parasite through these intermediate hosts. You know, sometimes, some days I'll actually drive either to school or away from school, and I'll see a brown and old hanging on my car, and they'll hang on for quite a while. Um, and so, unfortunately, that rate of spread we suspect will continue simply because humans are trucking this stuff all over the place. And by this stuff, I mean the frogs and the lizards and the roaches, and that that quite likely is spreading the parasitic infection. Here's a, a nicer photo of one of these parasites we pulled from a southern toad um, taken by Heather Walden at the UF School of Vet Med. So I'm going to start wrapping things up here. I've kind of flown through this, but I really wanted to give you more a taste of this, and I want a chance to kind of answer any questions if you have them. Um, but first of all, one of the things we now know is that the list of snake species known to be infected is expanding, and we expect it to keep expanding. As this parasite moves north, it will encounter more species of snakes, and there's no reason to think that any species of snake is really immune to this effect, infection. And so that's bad news. And the fact that we keep, every time we start looking at a new species of snake from the wild, um, we find infection. Um, that geographic range is rapidly expanding. Uh, hopefully this summer, uh, we'll be able to do a little more traveling. And I wanna see just how far north it is in Florida. And so we'll do some sampling in Southern Georgia and Northern Florida. Um, Another thing that we know is that this looks like a big conservation issue for snakes, both because so many snakes are infected, that's high prevalence, but we also have high infection intensity. And these parasites, uh, for example, in one black racer, I took out seven grams of parasite in a 92 gram snake, that they can be a significant fraction of the host's body weight and are sucking a ton of energy. And it's a, actually a very nasty way to remove energy from a host when you're sucking blood from the animal. Um, and so we appear to have some real health impacts here. And uh, we are gathering data which shows pygmy rattlesnake populations in particular seem to be declining throughout the Florida Peninsula uh, in recent years, probably as a result of penistome infections. And so the mystery of RO's life cycle um, is becoming more clear that our laboratory studies show that insects readily get it. A single contaminated meal will give a roach a nasty penistome infection. And similarly, eating a single infected roach will infect the vast majority of lizards and frogs that consume the roach. And ultimately, so many snake species at some point in their life cycle eat lizards and frogs. A lot of the snake species we think of mammal eaters, things like corn snakes and yellow rat snakes, uh, do eat mammals when they're adults, but when they're young, they eat primarily lizards and frogs. And so they're likely generating infections very early in life when it may be particularly deleterious to them. If there's any good news from what I have to talk to you about, it's that our students have found that the intermediate hosts, be they lizards or frogs or roaches, experience few health effects. We can't detect any difference in growth rate or survival in these experimental animals when we compare them to control animals. Um, and like I said before, the fact that these things are associated with species that hang out with humans, the fact that these things do really well in urbanized environments means that this parasite is likely to just keep rapidly spreading. And um, 
one line of research is to figure out its cold tolerance and figure out how far north it's likely to go. And so right now, we've got a bunch of ongoing work. This research, once it started, has only picked up steam. We never stop. Um, and in part, you can't stop because you've got animals in the lab that need to be maintained. And that colony of roaches that I've got right now will be the roaches we use to infect the next group of lizards or frogs and that so on. And so we just have to keep this work going constantly. Um, but we're gonna get a lot more field work done um, and a lot more lab work done. Um, and some of this in involves looking at what we call sublethal impacts on snakes. Um, and we've done a lot of work on this, on snake fungal disease in the past. My collaborators are really good physiological ecologists and um, we hope to continue that work, understanding what goes on when you're infected by penistomes. And really it's important that we understand what we call the comorbidity aspect of this, that having penistomes appears to be associated with a bunch of other nasty health effects for snakes, including this fungal disease. And right now um, we're at the point of the year in biology where we're basically recruiting our next group of student researchers. So I met with one student yesterday, I'll meet with a couple more this week and figure out what they're excited about, what we can do research on, what's doable. And um, they will like Carson and Jenna here, hopefully do some really interesting research and be able to present that both at Stetson and these guys are up in Alabama when they were presenting their posters. Jenna won a best student award against a bunch of PhD students in this which was uh, pretty nice. Um, but it's a great source of research uh, opportunities for our students. And we plan to continue that this summer and all next year. And so I'll take questions if you want. And I'll, I'll do a screen share here. Right now you're inside a snake. Um, this is a pygmy rattlesnake that was infected. We knew that from its species. We took it up to Gainesville and uh, one of our collaborators uh, ran an endoscope into it. And you're moving up, you can see lots of ribs in this huge, snakes have a huge single lung. And there is a penistome. Here comes the uh, jaws of death in this case, <laughs> a little grabby device that is on the end of the endoscope. And uh, Jim Wellahan, the veterinarian, is actually gonna grab this penistome right there and then back it out of the snake. The endoscope gets in there through a small incision on the side of the snake's body. Um, but basically, I'll stop that chair. Um, and if you guys uh, have any questions, I would be more than happy to see if I can answer them. Uh, it seems that Dr. Gibbs has a question. Uh, you just go ahead and share your audio and video if you want, Dr. Gibbs, or uh, post it in the chat. All right, yeah, so you sort of partially answered my first question was, which is about their temperature issues. I mean, are you, do you suspect that um, they probably don't themselves have any um, temperature issue that as long as they're in a tolerant host species, they probably are gonna be okay? Well, they're, you know, they're Southeast Asian, so a tropical environment. So they may be very susceptible to cold. Um, however, the snakes and the frogs and everything, of course, will avoid freezing temperatures, though the eggs can't necessarily do that. It may be that at least every winter, all the eggs in the environment die. Okay. Um, yeah. But it would be interesting to see if you chill a snake to a typical snake hibernation temperature for a month, will it still be pentastome infected when it comes out of that? And that's, you know, that's, that's, that's easily doable, right? And it's also a really interesting question. I'm afraid, you know, that actually that video where I showed you these uh, pentastomes crawling around inside a dead pygmy rattlesnake, that rattlesnake had been dead for about 48 hours and it had spent 36 hours in a refrigerator. And so when we opened it up, you know, the penistomes looked fine. They were crawling around. Uh, you know, I get the sense that the penistomes hanging out in the snake's lung are awfully tough. And they're probably the penistomes hanging out 
insisted in the peritoneum of a frog or a lizard are probably even tougher because they're less metabolically active. So it's really worrisome. I, I hope that cool temperatures have a big negative impact on these, but it wouldn't surprise me if they don't. Cold temperatures may be more important in terms of influencing the insect fauna and like longer lived roaches are probably better intermediate hosts than shorter lived insects that don't have a lot of time to get infected, have pentastome larval development, and then get eaten by a lizard or frog. But yeah, this is, you know, all speculation, right? <laughs> you know, that's where we are with this. Yeah. Well, thank you. Anybody else? Well, if not, I thank you all for your time and uh, I'm glad uh, Chris made it sure that everything went, went smoothly this time. That's great, Chris, I appreciate that in the time you put in yesterday to make sure uh, my laptop wouldn't misbehave. No. Not a problem, not a problem. I do have one uh, question real quick though, and it's one we talked about yesterday that I'm sure the rest would like to hear. If we find any type of snakes, it, should we be reaching out to you at all? Because I hear you say that you're interested in people in North. Yeah, Florida. no, particularly <laughs> like roadkill snakes. Um, you know, you sh everyone should keep a trash bag in their car. And when you see a roadkill snake, you know, pull over, throw it in the trash bag and give it to me. Um, and it's basically, it makes the road more scenic when you don't have a dead snake in it. And, uh, you know, gives me something or my students something to dissect, you know, and if they're horribly mangled, you might not want to, but yeah, and Chris, to be quite honest, snakes from brandy wine are particularly interesting um, because there's such a high prevalence and part of a, a paper we're putting together right now is comparing brandy wine to Lake Woodruff. These sites are only a few miles apart, right? Um, but they have really different reptile and amphibian assemblages and the parasite is doing great in both places and so I can get Lake Woodruff snakes I'm really good at getting snakes from Lake Woodruff but mm -hmm. snakes from Brandywine is trickier those black racers are hard to get your hands on <laughs> yeah I agree I've watched you try and chase out chase after one for a while well thank you very much uh as well thank you to everyone who uh, showed up today to uh hear uh, Dr. Farrell's uh Testimony is what I want to call it, um, but uh, his research. Uh, thank you all again for coming out and we'll see you at the next one.